Well, we're going to be in John chapter 20 today, so go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. Um, I'm, I talked with a couple of people about last week, and I said, hey, so be honest with me. Were you lost? Were you on track? And uh, so I figured what I would do is take what w- took 30 minutes last week to do it and do a quick three to four minute recap for those who just kind of needed a little bit of a refresher course, or you just needed just the top points because in the weeds, uh, maybe you got a little lost in there and me as your tour guide uh, got you lost. But real quickly, and a recap of last week, we took John's account of you know, what happened at the crucifixion. Now, if we look at John's account alone and only what John says, it appears that the crucifixion was after Passover, meaning how the Jewish leaders could not defile themselves for Passover. And you're thinking, wait a second, I thought Jesus, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had Passover with his disciples. I thought Jesus and the disciples had Passover. And then there was the crucifixion and he was crucified on Friday, buried and then risen Sunday. But if we look at just John's account, it seems like that's in conflict of that. And then on top of that, we take the words, if, if we take the words of Jesus literal, when he says, I will be in the tomb for three days and three nights, we back that up. You're like, well, you know, that just doesn't fit with our tradition of what we as evangelicals tr- celebrate here at Easter. And so what we did was compare what that was happening to the, the gospels and, and we might have friends that we work with or, or, or you know, around and go, well, the, the Bible contradicts itself and we need to be prepared as believers to be able to, to talk about that and not go, well, no, it doesn't. Um, and just be able to give facts. So we looked at that and realistically, um, what John is doing because of his target audience is given kind of a time frame. Uh, we know that the Feast of Unleavened Bread started after Passover, and during that entire time, the Jews were not allowed to eat leaven or they would defile themselves, become ceremonially unclean. And so therefore the Jewish leaders, when they didn't want to defile themselves during Passover, it wasn't necessarily the Passover meal or is what we would, some, some of us know as the Passover Seder. And so we looked at how Passover was kind of a time frame similar to how we talk about how it's Christmas. You know, oh, it's Christmas. Like, no, it's really the December 18th. And it's really Christmas season or it's the time of Christmas rather than Christmas day. And so when you look at that, we can see how John is really talking about it's a Passover time rather than maybe just a specific Passover meal. But then we looked at Jesus, his words, and he said, I'll be in the tomb for three days and three nights. Now, if we take that literal and we back up from the first day of the week, that doesn't fit with our evangelical uh, traditions. And so how do we rationalize that? Well, it's a Hebrew idiom meaning three days. And we talked about how we looked at Esther, we looked at 1 Samuel, how there were uh, both accounts in the Old Testament where they said, we won't do this or we need to do this for three days and three nights. And both instances said, and then on the third day, well, Jesus rose on the third day, but he said three days and three nights. So we look at what Jewish people uh, realized was any part of the day consists of the whole day. And so when Jesus met with his disciples on Wednesday evening of pa- Passover, Nisan 14, he, the next day in the, during the daylight time of Nisan 14 was crucified and put into the tomb before sunset. That would have been one day. Then that was the day of preparation because the next day was Passover, which would, we know is a Saturday. So that would be day two. And then on that next morning, that would have been day three. So any part of a day consists of a whole day. And so that's how we get to this whole Jesus was uh, crucified on a Friday, buried, and then risen on Sunday. I think I said Wednesday earlier and I misspoke, but Thursday night had a Passover, Friday crucified in the grave, Saturday, and then risen on Sunday. That's how we get our three days, not a full 24-hour day as we understand it. And so you're like, Pastor, why didn't you just preach that last week? Well, you need me to be up here for a full 30 minutes, and so we just need to take up all the time we needed to get that out. But we need to understand that the gospels don't contradict each other. As I said last week, if we ever come to a point and go, well, I thought they said this and Matthew says this, but Mark says this, the only person that is an error is the reader, not the author and perfecter, the God himself. He is perfect in all things, including his word. So if we ever come to a point where we're just kind of wrestling with it, I promise we're the ones in error, not 
the scriptures. Now, it's, it's good for us to understand that when we are, keep in mind when we read the Bible, the Bible wasn't written to people who lived in America in the year 2023. It was written to the people who were in that area, written to a specific group of people at a specific time with cultures and those kinds of things. If you go back to where we were about this time last year, we did a whole series on how to interpret the Bible. And if you want to, you can go back online and series on how to interpret the Bible. And if you want to, you can go back online and listen to those things. And we talk about how it's best for us to read scripture as a first hearer, not with our understanding of the crucifixion and what we saw in the passion of Christ and all those things and try to re visually read into what the scriptures have there because we'll probably mislead ourselves sometimes. That being said, let's look at uh, John chapter 20. We see in verse one, John writes, it says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Okay, question, how did Mary know where this tomb is? If we look at some of the other gospel accounts, we understand as, and even John mentions this later, Jesus was laid into a brand new tomb. Okay, which could indicate that this is a brand new area. If you ever go to a cemetery, you know, they, they kind of build it out in phases. And so what happens is sometimes you go there and you look at a, a tombstone for us to understand things in today's perspective. You look at a tombstone and you were to come back years later, the cemetery has grown for obvious reasons. Okay, and so what you thought was kind of in this area is kind of seems differently because the area has grown. Well, this is a new area, so it wasn't probably familiar to, to Mary and then the people in the area. So how in the world did Mary know where to go? Well, the neat thing is the gospels tell us. Luke chapter 23, it's not on the screen, but it says this. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to decisions and actions, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus and took it down and wrapped it in linen, shroud and laid it in the tomb in the stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation and Sabbath was the beginning, uh, was beginning. The women who had come to him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb, his body was laid. Then they returned and to prepare spices and ointments. I think in Mark's account says they even looked from a distance you gotta realize what had just taken place. This man who claimed to be God was in the middle of the night, given a trial. And the next day, presented from the crowd, crucified. This is not a place you wanna hang out, a place you wanna be around at this moment. So Mary and Mary and probably some other women are hanging out from a distance, watching Jesus' lifeless body being taken off the cross, being laid on the ground and then wrapped up in these linen clothes and then placed into a tomb where no one had ever been before and then sealed the tomb. You know, through other accounts that the Roman guards came and stood guard at the entrance of the tomb. And so they left and said, okay, let's go back and prepare the spices of the ornaments. So they knew where he was because they had watched him be buried. Now, this also gives an indication that the crucifixion was on Passover day on Nisan 14, because it says that they needed to get him in before Sunset before the Sabbath, it was the day of preparation. This would have been a Friday, okay? Because Sabbath was on a Saturday. The first of the week is on a Sunday. So that points to that timeline as well. Mary then uh, saw where Jesus was, retraced her steps to this new tomb and prepared some ointments. Now let's pause there for a little bit. If they really believed that Jesus was gonna rise from the grave, and why did they take the time to go and prepare the ointments and the spices? They know it was unnecessary. It would be not needed because Jesus would rise as he said he would. Everything is played out exactly as he said. You know what? There's no need to get these spices and prepare ointments because he's not going to be dead. He is going to live. So why on earth would they take this next step if it was unnecessary? The reality is, in my opinion, sometimes we experience what we experience and the moment speaks louder than the constant level of truth. And often we act and react into the things we feel or see versus what we know to be true. If you don't believe me, think about the last time you were afraid. Think about the last time you've allowed your, yourself to become afraid of something. And when it was over with, you're like, okay, well, you know, all right, you know, I get it. And you realize that that was probably a unnecessary fear. 
Maybe you're in an elevator and you're like, I don't like being in elevators. Don't ever tell me that if I'm in an elevator with you because um, I'm very quick to just start jumping. Um, I'm, I'm just that guy. If I know that you don't like elevators, I love you and I know God tells you, you have to forgive me. And so I just jump. Um, it's, I'm not proud of it, but it's just the reality of me. Um, that is if you're older than me, you're my wife, or um, you know, you're bigger than me, then usually I don't in those moments uh, jump. But the reality is when you get finally to that four, you get down the bottom, you're like, okay, I really didn't have that much to be worried about. But you allowed yourself to get worked up over something you probably know to be true, which is I've been in elders my whole life and nothing's happened. And by the way, there was only me and one other person this thing can hold like 40,000 pounds and there was probably only 200 of us in there. So, you know, probably not the case. And so we allowed our fears to take over on us. Or think about your last fight you had with your spouse or your kids. If somebody was what I call pull Zach Morris, you know, I'm saved by the bell. I know I'm aging myself here. Zach Morris would be like, time out. And everybody would freeze and he would go talk to the camera. If somebody could pull a time out in the mid fight with you and your spouse or you and your kids and said, time out and say, do they love you? Like, yes. Without a shadow of doubt, you know that they love you. Yes. Do you love them? Yes. Okay, time in. And then you went back and you're like, you know what? The fact that the coat hangers on the floor, not that big a deal anymore. You know, sometimes we allow our emotions to take over things and we allow our, those emotions allow us to dictate things we feel or see and they run rampant in our lives versus what's really the truth. You gotta understand these ladies watch Jesus literally be nailed and beaten, hung on a cross. And then when they grabbed the spear and shoved it into his side and water and blood came gushing out to his lifeless body sitting there on a cross and then they took it down. And they wrapped it up and they carried it to him. They, they're responding to what they see or feel, not necessarily what they know to be true in the moment. And many times we as Christians, we do the same. So we pick up in verse two. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciples, and one of the, the one Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. She goes there in the morning, he's not there. She runs and says, they've stolen the body. I know where they've laid him and he's not there. So Peter went out with the other disciples and they were going to the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the, the tomb first. They stopped and looked in. He saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came in following him and went into the tomb and the linen cloths were lying there and the faith cloths which had been on Jesus's head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up on a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. Mary runs and tells the disciples, Jesus's body, it's stolen. Again, she's responding in what she sees or what she feels, not what she's been told by Jesus himself to be true. And, and John clearly points out not once, not twice, but three different times that he is faster than Peter. I mean, he writes this and he's like, and the, the I got there first. And then he's like, and then later Peter showed up. And then the disciple who got there last went in. I mean, three different times in this little paragraph, he is letting, he's like, Lord, I know this is all about you, but I just need to let the world know from here on out that I'm faster than Peter. We're gonna sell this once and for all. We're gonna put it in the Bible. And everybody know it'll be true because why? It's in the Bible. So if we all get to heaven, we see John and Peter, we can look at him and go, Slowpoke, And then we can just move on and go on through our lives and go and celebrate and worship. But Mary says they've stolen the body. Verses nine and 10. For as they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. So they're in this moment and they said, well, we didn't understand from the scriptures. Now, if you look at that, it should jump off of the page and go, hold on a second. The New Testament wasn't written yet. The disciples didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have these accounts of these miracles. What scripture in the Old Testament is pointing to the fact that Jesus would not be in the tomb and die in the tomb? Well, most people agree, and there's a couple other ones, but I think the one that gives the most clear evidence is Psalm 1610. It says, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Psalms tells us that the Holy One would not stay among the dead or rot in the grave. So the scripture spoke to Jesus, the Holy One, 
the Lamb of God would not stay in the tomb, that he would rise. So, but they didn't understand that. Why? Because they're so caught up in the moment of what they saw and what they feel and what's happening to them going back to what did Jesus say was true? Let's recenter on what Jesus said and let's decide off that. It's no, we saw him taken down. We saw him put in that tomb and now he's not there. Someone stole his body, forgetting all the other things they've learned and understood it to be true about scripture. So verses 14 through 18, having this said, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but did not know it was Jesus. So Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him so that I may take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him in, in Aramaic and said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord and this is what he said to me. Now, why didn't she know it was Jesus? We don't really know. Maybe Jesus was wearing a tallit, a, a, a prayer, you know, cloth over his head. We, not really important why she didn't recognize him. What's important is what he said to her, which was don't cling to me. Now, maybe you've heard people say this, like the reason why Jesus told Mary not to cling to him was because he had not yet gone and uh, gone up to the father yet. And so, you know, he needed to stay pure and didn't want people to touch him and that kind of stuff. And, you know, he hasn't, you know, fully got his glorified body or whatever it may be. And they give these cases, but I struggle with that opinion because just about five or six verses later, he looks at Thomas and says, touch me. And I've heard people say, you know, she said, don't touch me because, you know, he hasn't yet gone to the father and she didn't, you know, he wasn't supposed to, to touch him because that would you know, make him unholy or whatever and unclean and not, you can make Jesus unholy. But yet don't cling to me really points to him saying, we can't stay here. This is not our permanent place. We can't stay here to so go tell the, the, my brothers that I'm here. Go tell them that I'm gonna to go to the Father. Let's get the word out. We can't stay here. We need to get the message going. Verses 22 through 23. And when he said this, he breathed, he, went to, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Now, Jesus is now speaking to his disciples at this point, and we see this passage can sometimes be troubling at times, but this whole breathing his spirit into them really is a, a parallel to Genesis when God breathes life into Adam. And so we see now the Holy Spirit now coming and Jesus breathes into them the Holy Spirit. He breathes into them. Now, that's saying to them, that, you know, what about forgiveness of sins? It sounds like the disciples now can walk around and say, your, forg your sins are forgiven and your sins are not forgiven. That's what it kind of sounds like. Well, the thing is the disciples knew that's not what Jesus was saying because they knew only God can forgive sin. And actually the Jewish leaders even knew only God can forgive sin. And Luke chapter five and 21 says, and the scribe and the Pharisees began to question him saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So what was Jesus saying in regards to forgive sin or not forgive sin? What was the message he was trying to get out to them? Well, he was saying that as you proclaim the gospel, you can with confidence or with assurance tell people if they accept this message that their sins are forgiven. However, if they reject this message, their sins are not forgiven. Not that the disciples have the power to forgive or not forgive. That's God and God alone. He's saying, as you proclaim the gospel, you proclaim the good news and share the message of who Jesus is and what he's done, you can tell people with confidence, your sins are forgiven by accepting this message or your sins are not forgiven. John 3, 36 echoes this. When John writes, it says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on him. So church, when we go out and we preach the good news, when we proclaim the good news to other people, 
It's not our job to forgive sins or not forgive sins. It's God's job. It's our job to simply be faithful. And we can with confidence when someone says, you know, I'm, I believe in this message. I believe in who Jesus is. We can say, guess what? Your sins are forgiven. Not because we're granting them forgiveness. God has. And those who've accepted this message, who accept the son, they have eternal life. Their sins are are forgiven. However, if they reject it, they do not have life and God's wrath still remains on their life. So we look at John chapter 20, 24 through 29. Now John, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin was not with them when Jesus came. This was the first time that Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but they said to him, unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place the finger and the mark of the nails and place my hand on his side, I will never believe. Church, let me stop right there. You're gonna encounter people as you love them and care for them and serve them and share with them the good news. There will be people who want evidence to be convinced that what you're saying or proclaiming is true. I just wanna comfort you. It's not your job to save them. It's not your job to prove to them that God is who he is. God will do it. We are simply the messengers. We're simply gardeners. We're not always there. We're not the ones who have to make the harvest. Sometimes we're planting a seed. Sometimes we're gardening. Sometimes we're weeding things out. So who knows the role God has playing for us? But I just want you to know, when you go to someone who says, well, I just, I can't believe in God. I don't believe in God because I don't believe the, the earth was created in six days. Your job is not to convince them that we have a, a new earth theology and the earth is you know, around 6,000 years or less, not millions and millions of years ago. Keep the main thing the main thing. This is who Jesus is. This is the message of the good news of the gospel, of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Well, I'm not, I can't give my life to him if, if, if I'm still hung up on this issue. Allow God to do the work in their life. You don't, you, it's not your job to convince them to beat them over the head with the Bible and get them to believe what you believe. It's the Holy Spirit's job to draw them unto the Father. Just be faithful. Just be consistent. And the beautiful thing is God knows what those people's hangs up are. He knew what ours was and he still beckoned us. Look, look at this, 26. Eight days later when the disciples uh, were inside again, Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. And Jesus came and stood among them and he said, boo, no. It sort of sounded like boo. He really said, peace be with you. But you can imagine you're standing there, doors are locked. You know that you feel like everything around you is coming to a crumble. These guys said they saw Jesus. I haven't seen him. I'm not believing. I don't know who I should believe now. All of a sudden, boom, there he is. And he goes, peace be with you. Now notice these powerful verses right here in verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, put your hand here, place it on my side. He knew what Thomas needed to, to believe in him. The disciples weren't sitting around going, okay, let me hear, I've come with four reasons why you should believe in Jesus as the son of God. Jesus has really risen. And here the first one is A and B. They did not give them an acrostic of love or forgiveness to convince Thomas what he needed. Jesus knew what he needed. And when he saw them, he said, peace be with you, Thomas, come here. I know that you've been hung up on. Put your hands right here. Put your hand right here. Church, I just wanna just give you a little bit of freedom and hopefully confidence to know that when you, we are out proclaiming the good news and people are gonna have all their sorts of hangups of why they should or shouldn't believe, allow the Holy Spirit to work through you to their life. Jesus knows what they need. Jesus understands their hurt and their pain and their baggage and their hangups and their insecurities way better than we do and can explain it in way better terms than we ever could despite our Bible studies or degrees or whatever it may be. Jesus came in, looked at Thomas and says, I know what you're missing for you to believe. Come here, I'll take care of that. So we look in verse 30, 31. Now Jesus did other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus did way more than was recorded, but this is recorded so that we could believe. If you have your bulletins real quickly, three things I want us to remind us of is Jesus will always do what he said he would do. Jesus will always do what he said he would do. So this begs the question, how do we know what the Lord has said he would do? 
the word of God. We have to go off what God's word says. That's where we find his promises. We, we don't look back and go, well, you know, I'm having a really hard week and you know, this isn't fair and this isn't going on my way. And, you know, and God's word says that he wants happiness for my life. No, that's not what the Bible says. Matter of fact, he says, count it all joy when you go through these trials. Well, this is just a really dark time in my life and I'm just, you know, I don't, don't, don't have a lot of friends right now. I don't have a lot of this and, and God surely doesn't want me to have a bad day. Is that what the Bible says? I don't think Jesus had a great day on Calvary, but it's exactly what the world needed. Sometimes we convince ourselves that what we want is God's plan and what we think should happen to us is God's promise. And we get these things mixed up sometimes in our lives and we, we kind of realize that, you know, we get mad at God and the Bible because things aren't going our way and God's like, I never promised you that. That's not what I said. God, Jesus will do, always do what he said he would do, but in order to understand what he said he would do, we must be in the word of God, not just leaning on our own understandings or our wants or our desires or what some TV preacher may have said or some book said that 2023 is a year of blessing. If you ever hear a, a message title like that or a book title like that, just don't listen to it. This health and wealth and prosperity stuff, that's not the good news. The fact that I was dead in my sin and Christ loved me enough to die while I was still a sinner, that is good news. Second thing is this, peace comes when in the presence of Jesus. When the disciples were worried and locked themselves in a house, Jesus arrived and he says, peace be with you. There is peace when you were in the presence of Jesus. On a little side note, if you're ever having to go into work and you just know this day is not gonna be a great day. Like it's, you've got a meeting you're not looking forward to. You've got, a, you've got a, a, a client or a customer or an employee or an employer or whatever. You're just not really looking forward to it. Can I just encourage you, take a step back. Instead of listening to talk radio or some politic news or whatever, put on some worship music and just praise God the Lord. If you got to take one hand off and one hand up, go for it. Just keep your eyes open. Unless you're driving a Tesla, then I think you're okay. I don't know. I've never been in one. Worship. Because being in the presence of Jesus brings peace. For me, I actually don't like to even listen to music. I just spend time listening to the Lord. I remember being in a, in a car one time, Caleb and I were coming back from Arkansas one time and I was driving the long leg and he wakes up and about 15 minutes into it, he's like, have you had the radio off this whole time? Said, yeah. That's like three hours. I'm like, yeah. What do you do? Poked up my chest, real proud and spiritual. I was like, praying, son. You know, no. Sometimes we just need to be in the presence of Jesus. When our life is crumbling, our world is falling in, and everything just seems to be not going according to plan, and we need peace, be in the presence of Jesus. Peace be with you. There's nothing better than just time with the Lord. The last thing is this. Jesus has done things in our lives so that others will believe. Think of it this way. The things you've gone through, yeah, the things that you, when you were seven and eight, when you were 16 and 15, that first painful breakup that you went through, the time when your parents split up and they got back together and they split up again, the time that you saw your parents lose their job and then you, moved, you had to go move in with grandma for the summer. All those things that you're like, I just don't like telling people all those things. Can I just tell you that the Lord has done the work in your life? It's so that other people can believe. These things are recorded so that you may believe. Our life is a living testimony. It's a living story of what God has done in our life through our bad decisions and through our good decisions, through our disobedience and through our obedience, so that why? We can keep to ourselves, put it on our journal, and never tell anyone else. Wrong. So that others believe. I want to speak to the older men real quick. Men, you don't understand how much of a blessing you are to my life. 
For years, I've sat around and listened to men talk about times when they were young, right out of the army, starting their company up or working for their first employer or whatever it may be. There's so much wisdom that I can absorb from listening to you. But men, if you don't talk, guys like me will never hear. And the things the Lord has done in your life is so that others may believe. Believe in the faithfulness to hear how God has been faithful in your life. And then when I see and I feel like God isn't being faithful to me and, and I'm in, in, a, in a, an emotional pit thing and what am I doing here? I can recount on the testimonies of my brothers. Women, if all you do is sit around with the people of your own age and sit around and just talk and you never share the goodness of God. You never share. You know, I remember when I, we were married with our first two years of marriage. We've been married 55 years. To share that story, that wisdom to a younger person, I'm telling you, you're thinking, oh, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear it. And I can tell you as a younger person, we need to hear it. Jesus has done things in our lives so that others may believe. And if we will be a church that is just zipped-lipped, then we'll never share the faithfulness of God. We'll never be encouraged through people's stories, whether they were good or bad. The reality is, church, Jesus has done some amazing things and we probably could give him a title or a name for every one of those things he's done in our lives. He's been our provider, our healer, our sustainer, our caregiver, lover of our soul. So as we close today in a time of worship, let's just be reminded of the faithfulness of God. We see him doing what he's always said he would do. Either the scriptures and Psalms say he would rise again. But sometimes we're so caught up on seeing what is in front of us and we forget the promises of God. So with that being said, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for how you faithfully love us. Even so many times we seem to be unfaithful. Thank you for taking us back. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for all that you are in our life. And may we live a life devoted to you and to your kingdom's cause. In your name we pray, amen. Church, let's stand and let's spend some time worshiping before we dismiss. Sing it.
beginning and the end You are Lord and servant You're the son of man You're the line of Judah You're the risen man You're the second Adam You're to lead us home You are your Have a great week. We'll see you next time.